we are really excited to have Aaron Roth speak to us today. Aaron is a professor of computer, computer and information sciences at University of Pennsylvania, affiliated with the Warren Center of Network and Data Sciences, co-director of Network and Social Systems Engineering Next program. He is also an Amazon scholar at Amazon AWS. He is a recipient of PKS Award in 2016, Sloan Research Fellowship, NSF Career Award and research awards from Yahoo, Amazon, and Google. This research focuses on algorithmic foundations of data privacy, algorithmic fairness, game theory, and machine mechanism design, learning theory, and the intersection of these topics. He's also the co-author of a book with Cynthia Dwork, The Algorithmic Foundations of Data Privacy. Recently, he also co-authored a book with Michael Kearns named The Ethical Algorithm. And he is going to talk to us about uncertainty estimation via multi-calibration. We're really excited. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Uh, I already said he had a privacy reading group and invited me to give a talk about privacy, but then I tricked him and sent him this abstract and said, so hopefully it's not too disappointing. Um, but what I want to talk about are, um, you know, it's a, it's sort of a fundamental question. What do and what should reported probability estimates mean? And, and to make this concrete, let me start with a example. So suppose you are um, a patient in need of an anticoagulant called warfarin. And you know I know very little about warfarin, except that it is um, an example of a drug that comes out of personalized medicine. It turns out that the ideal dosage for warfarin uh, depends very much on uh, your individual characteristics, and the ideal dosage can differ by orders of magnitude between people. And so you walk into your doctor's office, and your doctor tells you, well, given everything I know about you, um, I've got a statistical model, and it predicts that your stable warfarin dosage is, is something, f of x. And, you know, getting the wrong dosage is dangerous, so you might reasonably ask, uh, how sure are you of this? And there's a couple of things you might imagine the doctor could tell you. For example, she could tell you that uh, the, the conditional variance, given our prediction, is something, and maybe g of x. Um, and you could say, OK, you know, is there anything else you could tell me? And perhaps she could say, well, you know, I've got a 95% prediction interval that your stable dosage lies between some lower bound l of x and, and some upper bound u of x. OK, so there's various. Uh, statements about probability that your doctor could tell you in response to these queries. And the question is, you know, what do these things mean? And so you might ideally hope that what these numbers are are conditional probability estimates, meaning, um, you know, maybe what f of x is is the expectation of the label, in this case, your ideal warfarin dosage, conditional on everything that we know about you. And similarly, we might hope that this prediction interval is what's called a conditional prediction interval, which again, conditions on all of your observable features and says that with 95% probability, somehow over the you know unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world, but conditional on everything we know about you, um, your dosage is between L of X and U of X. And it would be great if the numbers meant this, because then you could really interpret them as estimates about you as an individual, and you could you could try to reasonably make decisions about what you should do next. But it's more likely that numbers reported like this um, are not conditional estimates, but are instead marginal estimates. So for example, f of x, rather than being the mean of your label distribution conditional on everything we know about you, um, you know, in the best case, probably it's calibrated. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk very precisely about what calibration means in a few slides. So if, if you haven't encountered it before, uh, don't worry about it for now. And similarly, this prediction interval uh, likely is not a conditional prediction interval, but is a marginal prediction interval, meaning on average over people, um, what we can say about this prediction interval is that it tends to cover the true label for 95% of people. Okay, so the, the difference between a conditional and a marginal prediction is whether 
in the one case, we are averaging entirely over the unrealized or unmeasured randomness of the world, but conditioning on everything we know about you, or in the other case, the more likely case, whether we are instead averaging over people. And if you think about it, it's sort of clear why we can't generally hope to get these conditional probability or uncertainty estimates, right? It's too much to ask for in a rich feature space because if I have never seen anyone exactly like you before, and again, this will be the common case if we have a rich enough feature space, then, you know, strictly speaking, I have no information at all about the conditional label distribution conditional on all of your observable features X, because I've never seen any samples from this distribution before. And so, of course, there's a couple of standard solutions. Um, Maybe the classical one is to make parametric assumptions. Okay, so I could, rather than assuming that label distributions are, you know, potentially arbitrarily different across different uh, different realizations of the features, I could make some kind of parametric assumption. So, for example, maybe I would assume that the expectation for your label was some unknown linear function of your features. This would be the ordinary least squares model. And once I made assumptions like this. I could form uh, confidence regions around the parameters, and those would translate into prediction intervals, you know, conditional on x. But of course, these conditional um, prediction intervals would only be valid to the extent that the model was correct. And you know, that's a dangerous assumption. You know, models are never entirely correct, and even if they tend to perform well in aggregate, that doesn't mean that we should assume. Uh, correctness for particular individuals, which is what we would be doing when we make uh, conditional prediction, uh, conditional predictions about them. And then, of course, the other standard solution is to give up on conditional guarantees and, and to go to marginal guarantees. And that's what is done when we talk about calibration. That's what's done when we talk about things like conformal prediction. OK. so. Let's think about marginal guarantees. Should we be happy with marginal guarantees? And so suppose the doctor tells you that, well, your 95% marginal prediction interval uh, is between L of X and U of X. Does that mean anything to you? And I want to suggest that it might mean less to you than you might think. So for example, Suppose you are part of a demographic group that is uh, less than 5% of the population. Then it is entirely consistent with the guarantees of a marginal prediction interval that 100% of the time, your realized warfarin dosage does not fall within this interval, right? Like a marginal prediction interval is only a promise about what happens for 95% of people in the data set, and so may literally um, be disjoint from the truth you know, for people like you if people like you represent a relatively small proportion of the, of the data set. Now, of course, you know, it's possible that, that people have done studies uh, not just you know, in aggregate over a, a huge heterogeneous population. Maybe there have been targeted studies for different demographic groups. So you could ask your doctor, you know, okay, but, but what about for people like me? And your doctor could think hard about what that means, you know, people like you, and, and could flip through her medical journal, and she could say, well, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction interval ranges from A to B. And of course, for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction interval ranges from C to D. Oh, and for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction interval ranges from E to F. Right? And, and you, of course, might simultaneously be a member of all of these demographic groups. But again, it is entirely consistent with the guarantees of a marginal prediction interval that, for example, A to B might be disjoint from E to F. And, and so again, it's not at all clear how to interpret these guarantees, even if you are a member of each of these demographic groups. Because, for example, you know, what can we say about you if you're in the intersection of them? OK. And so this question has arisen before. In particular, um, you know, this issue arises 
not just for estimates of uncertainty, but even just for estimates of means, right? Like I could have told the same story where, you know, in each of these different demographic groups, um, the mean dosage is, is different. You know, what, how should you think about that for you as an individual? And this is the problem that is addressed by this very nice work on multi-calibration. I'm going to call it mean multi-calibration because we're going to generalize it to moments um, by Hubert Johnson et al. from 2018. And so let me tell you what that is. In fact, I'll um, define some notation that'll be broadly useful for us in this talk. I'll define what calibration means and, and how multi-calibration is an extension of that. And, and first, I want to just talk about something simple called mean consistency. Okay, so suppose what we have is a distribution over um, labeled examples. Uh, I'm going to think of examples as being described by features in some abstract feature space X. The labels are going to be, I'm going to think about them as uh, normalized real numbers that lie between 0 and 1. And for now, what we're going to try to come up with is a mean predictor, some function mu bar which purports to map features X to ideally um, the means of the label distribution conditional on X. Okay. Now, suppose we've got a collection of, of people, a, a subset of the feature space S. I write mu of S to denote the true expected value for the label conditional on X being an S. Okay, so this is a, an expectation over a random sample from the population conditional on the features lying in the set S. And this is the true expectation of the label. Similarly, I've got this predictor, mu bar. I'm going to write mu bar of S to mean the expected value of our predicted label, given that um, X is in S. And I'll just say that a predictor, this should say mu bar, is mean consistent on a set S if mu bar of S is equal to mu of S, meaning um, if, the, if the expected prediction is equal to the expected label. And we're never going to be able to achieve exact mean consistency on anything because because we're working with finite samples. So I'll define also a, a, an approximate version of that called epsilon approximate mean consistency, which allows um, these quantities to to differ by some amount depending on epsilon. And for reasons that will be clear later in the talk, I'm going to parameterize this approximate bound by the measure of the set S. And so when I say that um, a predictor is epsilon mean consistent on a set S, what that means is that the difference between the true mean and the predicted mean on the set can differ by an amount that um, is sort of more relaxed, the smaller the measure of the set, by epsilon over the probability that a random point falls within the set. And, and we'll see later that this is the right way to parameterize this approximation based on what we can achieve from finite samples. OK, so what's can, calibration? Nope. Sorry, yeah. can I ask a cal um, uh, terminology question? Um, mm -hmm. For mu bar of s, when you're taking expectations, what are you taking expectations over? So I think we need to be, uh, I just want to make sure yeah. I've got clear what we're expect yeah, so, taking expectations over. So this is an expectation over. over a random sample from p, OK? so x comma y, um, conditional on x lying within the set S. OK. OK, so random sample over x and y. Yeah, although this expression happens not to depend on y. Okay. Good? Yeah. OK, so what, so what regular old calibration? And so I'm going to define calibration by um, talking about a discretization parameter m. OK, so let's maybe imagine for a moment that we have to make predictions on a discrete grid. So you know, when I'm going to predict the mean of something, it'll be either 0 or 1 over m or 2 over m all, all the way up through 1. OK, in fact, I'm going to allow for real valued predictions, not just discrete predictions. But it's going to be helpful to think about this grid as the set of allowable predictions. OK. And then notationally, I will write that a prediction, mu bar of x, is in 
the is in bucket i if okay morally we predict that uh, the expected value of y conditional on x is i over m okay now i'll actually allow for real valued predictions and so um, our prediction lying in bucket i will actually just mean that our prediction is closer to i over m than to other than to any of these other discrete grid points. Okay. And then one more piece of notation: if I have some demographic group, some collection of people, some subset of the feature space X, um, I will write s of mu bar comma i to denote the set of people from this group S whose predictions are I over M. Okay. And then with that notation in hand, what calibration means is that our predictor should be epsilon mean consistent on um, any subset of the data universe on which we predict I for any of these discrete grid points I. Okay, so for example, if I'm making weather predictions, uh, so there's some binary outcome, it, it rains or it doesn't rain, um, being calibrated means that when I look at all of those days on which I predicted a 10% chance of rain, it should have rained 10% of the time. On all of those days on which I predicted a 20% chance of rain, it should have, it should have rained 20% of the time. Okay. A quick question. Could you, could you just yeah. remind me what x of mu bar i is? Yeah. So, so x is the entire feature space. And this is the set of points in the feature space on which we predict uh, mean i over m, or more precisely, on which our predictions are closer to i over m than to any of the other grid points. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so, so regular old calibration is just defined based on our predictions. And we ask for mean consistency on subsets of the entire feature space defined only by, by our predictions. And, and multi-calibration is going to be a refinement of that. So when we talk about multi-calibration, this guarantee will be parameterized by an arbitrary collection of possibly overlapping sets, G. Think about these as maybe all of the different demographic groups that might be relevant for drug prediction. And we say that a predictor is multi-calibrated if it is mean consistent on every, uh, on the set of people who are in the intersection of every possible set S, so every possible demographic group in this collection G that we care about intersected with the set of people for whom we made particular predictions, like i over m. OK, so, so what multi-calibration is asking for is calibration not just overall, but even conditional on um, an individual lying within any of these demographic groups s. And so this is, this is useful, right? Like if you have a multi-calibrated mean estimator, this means that you will get a single point prediction for, um, for, for an expectation that you would love to interpret as a conditional expectation for your label given all of your features. It doesn't mean that. Uh, it's still a marginal expectation. But it means that you can interpret this single point prediction um, at, your, um, at your option as corresponding to an average over any of the demographic groups um, that you are a member of and that are contained in this set G. And Hebert Johnson et al. give an algorithm for, uh, for actually obtaining this from finite samples. OK, and, and so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to generalize this notion of multi-calibration uh, to uncertainty estimation. And so we're going to show how to achieve it, not just for means, but for variances and for other higher moments. And we're also going to show how to get a notion of multi-calibrated prediction intervals. And I'm likely not going to have time to get to this, but what we can also do is we can obtain all of these results, not just in the batch distributional setting, but uh, in an online setting against an adversary. Um, and when we, when we talk about prediction intervals, this really solves the 
problem that the conformal prediction literature aims to solve, uh, but without any distributional assumptions at all. And also, rather than just getting these coarse marginal guarantees, we, we get um, sort of conditional prediction intervals conditional on lying in any of these subgroups um, with, which, with, with respect to which we will be multi-calibrated. Okay. And so the first thing to do is to think about what moment multi-calibration should even mean. So, you know, what mean calibration means is that informally, the average label amongst all points for which we predicted mean I over M should be I over M. And so maybe by pattern matching, we would think, well, you know, for variance, for example, um, what we want is that the variance on the set of all points for which we predicted variance i over m should be i over m. But if you think about this for a moment, um, th this isn't desirable or feasible. You should think about um, multi-calibration as parameterizing some set of statistical tests that basically fail to distinguish your predictor from the ideal object that you would like to have, which is the uh, con which is the conditional label distribution conditional on X, right? So, so for mean calibration, these tests correspond to computing the mean of the label on different sets of groups. And in particular, for any collection of groups, the true conditional uh, expectation of the label conditional on X would satisfy perfect mean multi-calibration. But observe that, um, and, and the reason for that, the reason for that is that um, expectations are linear, right? Expectations uh, are linear operators. So if you get the expectation right um, on every single point, which you would if you had um, the true conditional label distribution given X, then uh, on average, you'd also get the expectation right averaged over any collection of groups. The problem is that when you move from expectations to higher moments, um, you lose this linearity, like variances no longer combine linearly. So, so let me just give you an example. Uh, suppose our distribution was extremely simple. There were only two types of people, X1 and X2, and your features entirely deterministically determine your label. So, um, if you're of type X1, your label is zero. If you're of type X2, your label is one. Then if we had the true um, case moment distribution, say like the true um, variance of the label distribution conditional on X, we would um, correctly predict that for every individual, their variance was zero because conditioning on X1 well, deterministically, the label is zero, and, and so there's zero variance. Similarly, conditioning on X2, deterministically, their label is one, and so there's zero variance. And yet, of course, if I look at the set of people for whom I've predicted variance zero, well, that's everybody, right? Both, both people have variance zero. But if I pick a random person from this set, the variance of the label distribution is not zero now. It's a, it's a quarter, right, because it's now a... a Bernoulli coin flip, right? Half the time the label zero, half the time is one. And so this is just observing that because variances and other higher moments are not linear, uh, this sort of pattern matching definition of moment calibration is, is not what we want. Okay, so, you know, let's just repeat that observation again. If you look up on Wikipedia uh, for a formula for the variance of a mixture distribution, you'll find this formula. It, this, you know, if the if we're taking the mixture of um, a bunch of different um, a bunch of different random variables that each have mean, mu, l, and have some moments, then they combine like this, and it's you know nonlinear, it's non-convex, but um, let me make a, a simple observation, which is going to maybe um, motivate the, the definition we end up giving for, for mo moment multi-calibration. If it happens, right, if we get lucky and it happens that we are 
thinking about a mixture distribution where all of the random variables in our mixture ha have the same mean. So all of the means mu l of our mixture components equal the mean of the mixture, then all of these annoying sort of nonlinear terms evaluate to zero. And we, we again get that moments like variances combine linearly. That is, for any moment, like you know, our second moment for variance, the moment of a you know the, the variance of a mixture distribution uh, is just the corresponding um, weighted average of the variances of the mixture components if we were lucky and everything in our mixture distribution had the same mean. Okay. And, and so now let me tell you um, what we are going to mean by moment calibration. And it, it's something I'm going to call mean conditioned moment multi calibration. Okay, so first, um, some notation corresponding to the notation we just talked about for mean multi-calibration. I will write mk of s to denote the true conditional kth moment, conditional on um, x, the features, lying in this set s. Right. So this is um, the conditional distribution, the conditional expectation of the label minus the mean of the label conditional on lying in S raised to the kth power. OK, the central kth moment. And similarly, if I have a moment predictor that purports to correctly predict the conditional uh, label moments for each individual x, I will write m bar of k, our, our average prediction uh, for a set s, to be just the average value of our, for example, variance predictions averaged over those individuals within the set S. OK? And I'll say that a predictor is epsilon moment consistent on a set S or moment consistent on a set S if these two quantities are equal. If the true kth moment on this set S is equal to the average of our individual moment predictions of people in this set S. And more generally, um, I'll say it's epsilon moment consistent by allowing the same kind of slack that we did for means. And remember, we do not want to ask that um, our predictor be epsilon moment consistent on every set, because we just saw that even the you know, true um, distributional moments will not satisfy this property. OK. And so given a set S and a mean predictor and a moment predictor, Let's say, let's define this little piece of notation to mean the people within the set S for which we predicted mean i over m and for which we predicted moment j over m. OK, so this is the subset of people in S for whom we made a particular mean prediction and simultaneously a particular moment prediction. We will then say that a pair of predictors, one that is a mean predictor and one that is a moment predictor are mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated on some collection of sets G. If for every group, like say demographic group within G, and for every pair of mean and moment predictions, our mean predictor is epsilon mean consistent on the set of people in S for whom we made mean prediction I and moment prediction J. And simultaneously, our moment predictor is epsilon moment consistent on the set of people for whom we made prediction i, mean prediction i, and moment prediction j. And observe that the true distributional quantities, right? Like if, if mu hat was really the conditional um, mean, the, the conditional label mean, conditional on x, and if uh, m bar k was truly the actual conditional label kth moment, conditional on x, then um, that correct distributional pair really would be mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated. Because we would be asking for moment consistency only on these subsets of s corresponding to people for whom we made the same mean prediction. And because in this thought experiment, um, our mean predictor really was the true 
uh, distributional expectation conditional on X, we would be asking for moment consistency just on sets um, of, of random variables corresponding to labels that all have the same mean. And remember, that is exactly the place in which the true um, moments satisfy this nice linearity. OK? OK, so before I tell you how to achieve um, something like this, let me walk through what exactly it would mean if, if we could come up with predictors that were mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated. And so let's start maybe like verbatim, like, like what does the definition literally mean? OK, so the doctor tells you, well, your mean ideal dosage is v hat, and the, the variance of your dosage is sigma hat. So literally, from reading off the definition, what you can deduce is that amongst all of the people who received this same prediction, meaning who received a prediction of a mean of v hat and a variance of sigma hat, their true dosage on it like really did average out to v hat, and the variance among this population really was sigma hat. And I can, at my option, simultaneously interpret this not just as an average over the entire population, but over any demographic group within the set G for which we are multi-calibrated, uh, for which I am a member. OK, so it allows you to get this point prediction and uh, the means and also the variances and any higher moments that were given to you are actually correct, um, correct estimates of the moments on these conditional distributions that are conditioned on your demographic group and the predictions that were made. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so if I recall uh, the definition of um, sort of how good these things are degrade with the size of the demographic group being considered. Mm -hmm. uh, so how does that play into the our interpretation here of our patient and, and doctor? Um, yeah, so, so we can um, talk about it at the end. I I'm going to have sort of versions of the bounds I'm going to show you parameterized by like the error, the error terms. But um, yeah, like you're right. Like there's this fundamental issue that I just cannot estimate statistics very reliably on small groups. And so, um, you know, there are error terms here. And these error terms scale with the size of the group that you want to interpret this as an average over. And, and so the error terms will be higher if you want to think about this as an average over a very small group, and that is unavoidable. So, you know, there, there are no error terms on this slide, but I have another slide that has some error terms, and the error terms get bigger with the size of the group. Does that I, roughly I, your question? I, that statement. I, I was just wondering about the interpretation, but I think we'll get to it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the interpretation is this, except that it's not really v hat and sigma hat. It's like v hat plus or minus error, sigma hat plus or minus error, and you will know what the error term is if you know the size of the group that you're interested in. <laughs> OK. Um, so the other thing is that you can use, like, like, what can you do with these like moment estimates? Well, you can use these moment estimates just as you would use real moments, real distributional moments, because these are real distributional moments, right? So that's what moment consistency promises. These are real distributional moments of the induced distributions on these demographic groups restricted to people for whom we made particular pairs of predictions. So for example, one thing that moments are useful for is tail bounds, right? If I know some moments of a distribution, I can prove that it is uh, unlikely that the realization of a random variable greatly exceeds its expectation by using things like Chebyshev's inequality and, and generalizations to higher moments. Um, and and by the way, someone seems like they've got their microphone on, so it might be good to mute it. If you had real distributional moments of the label distribution, conditional on the features, um, 
you could use things like Chebyshev's inequality and, and the corresponding inequalities for higher moments to get true conditional prediction intervals that would look like this, that, that would say, for you in particular, like conditioning on all of your features X, the probability that your label falls outside some specified window around your label mean is uh, small. In particular, this, this interval has coverage probability one minus delta. Well, if you have mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated estimates, then you can write down exactly the same expression, okay, except instead of the true mean, you use the mean prediction. Instead of the true moment, you use the moment uh, estimate. And you get exactly the same prediction interval, um, except it's no longer a conditional prediction interval. It is a marginal prediction interval but it is simultaneously a marginal prediction interval as averaged over any of these groups that you like. And again, it's like a single point prediction. You can interpret this as an average over any one of these groups at your option. And again, this is what you'd get if you were perfectly uh, moment, a mean condition moment multi-calibrated. Um, you won't be, you'll only be approximately so. And there are error terms here that I can show you on a slide at the end. But basically you can, you'll get an expression that looks like this on any sufficiently large group. Okay, so, you know, that's what mean conditioned moment multi-calibration is. How can we achieve it? And first, let me just think about a much simpler thing, just mean consistency. So suppose what I wanted was something really ambitious. I actually want to be like epsilon mean consistent on absolutely every set S. Okay, so it's like the only thing that is mean, perfectly mean consistent on absolutely every set S is the true conditional label distribution. But, you know, maybe we'll just try to approximately satisfy this. So I could view this as a min-max problem where I want to minimize over all possible mean predictors the maximum over all possible subsets of the absolute value difference between the true mean on that subset and the mean of my predictions on that subset. And so I want this to be an absolute value difference. So I'll also allow the maximum to be taken over a sign parameter lambda. Okay, so the sign parameter will always be set to cause this expression to evaluate to its absolute value. And I'll also scale this term by the measure of the set S. Okay, which won't change its sign um, and won't change the fact that if I could exactly solve this min-max problem, I would have recovered the true um, conditional uh, label distribution. Um, but rescales things in a way that makes this a linear program. Okay, because remember mu and mu bar are conditional probabilities. Right, that they have in their denominator a term that is equal to the measure of the set S. And so by multiplying by the measure of the set S, this linearizes these terms and causes this thing to just be a very large linear program, which we can solve with gradient descent. Okay, so here's some, you know, like a general version of, of projected gradient descent. And, and I'll think about it as interacting with, a, with an audit player who you should think of as attempting at every round to identify a set on which our current predictor mu bar is not mean consistent. Okay, so we'll start with an arbitrary mean predictor, some function mapping features to numbers between zero and one. And in rounds, the audit player will identify some set intuitively, one on which our, our mean consistency error is high and then we'll do a gradient descent update uh, on the predictions for members of that set. And via a very standard gradient descent kind of analysis, you get the following theorem, that if at every round, the auditor is identifying a set S that witnesses a failure of alpha mean consistency, then this procedure can continue for only one over alpha squared many rounds before um, we must actually at that point be alpha mean consistent on absolutely every set. Okay, so this is just gradient descent. 
But an implication is that if the audit player is always attempting to identify a set that witnesses a failure of epsilon multi-calibration, so one of these sets S defined by a demographic group that we care about, and a slice of the population defined by the predictions of the current estimator, if the audit player always finds a set witnessing a failure of epsilon mean multi-calibration whenever one exists, then this quickly results in a, you know, in fewer than one over epsilon squared many rounds, in a predictor that is epsilon mean multi-calibrated. Because e either the auditor will reach a point at which there is no more set witnessing a, a failure of epsilon multi-calibration, in which case we're done, uh, or else um, it'll have gone on for one over epsilon squared many rounds and we will be multi-calibrated because we will in fact be mean consistent on every set. And note that this argument really has nothing to do with the structure of the sets corresponding to multi-calibration. It'll work for finding a predictor that is mean consistent on any particular specified collection of sets. Okay. And so we wanna think about how to generalize this to moment multi-calibration. And again, remember that our main obstacle is that these moments um, are, are non-linear, they're non-convex. And so we can't just write down the same min-max problem and then express it as a convex program. And so maybe here's like a, a naive idea, like a, something like this is about to work. So it's not like totally naive, but like this is maybe the first thing you'd think of and, and it doesn't work. Suppose we already had a good mean predictor mu hat, like maybe mu hat was, you know, multi-calibrated, mean multi-calibrated or something. Then we could try to like define pseudo moment labels where the label y hat for a point x would be like y minus our prediction for the expectation of y given x raised to the kth power, okay? And we could try to ask for mean consistency for some collection of sets with respect to these pseudo moment labels. And maybe we would call that pseudo moment consistency with respect to mu bar. And the reason this might be tempting is because if mu bar really was the true conditional expectation of the label given X, then pseudo moment consistency like really would be a moment consistency because the expectation of this quantity, if this really was the expectation of Y conditioned on any set S, right? The expectation of this quantity over a set S really would be the true conditional kth moment. The problem of course, right? The reason why this is not gonna immediately work is that that's only true if mu bar um, like is mu, if mu bar corresponds to the true conditional expectation of Y given X. Okay, so, so we've already noted that you know, one reason you might think of doing this is because if mu bar was mu, the true conditional label distribution, then pseudo moment consistency would just be moment consistency. But let's also note that this is something we can achieve, right? Because this uh, pseudo moment consistency is just mean consistency with respect to some, you know, funny new labels that we invented. But our algorithm for achieving mean consistency did not rely on any property of the true labels. We might as well run the algorithm with these labels. And so here's a lemma that you can prove that is gonna be very useful to us. And it says, suppose I have a pair of predictors, a mean predictor and a moment predictor, such that somehow for every set S, simultaneously for every set S and for every pair of mean and moment predictions I and J, my mean predictor really is mean consistent on the set of people in S for whom I predicted mean I and for whom I predicted moment J. And also my moment predictor is pseudo moment consistent on the set of people in S for whom I predicted mean I and moment J. With respect to the pseudo labels, the pseudo moment labels defined by my mean predictor. The lemma says that if both of those conditions hold, then the pair mu and mk of the mean predictor and the moment predictors, these are mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated with respect to G, where the approximation parameter has gotten worse by a factor equal to k plus one, where k is the moment that we care about here. So, you know, k is two for variance, for example. 
so our goal is going to be to try to achieve the hypotheses of this lemma so that we can get the conclusion that we've found a mean condition multi-calibrated set of predictors. The problem, of course, is that these conditions have a circular dependency, right? The, the sets on which we, the, the sets on which our mean predictor must be mean consistent are not defined until our moment predictor is defined. But on the other hand, um, the condition that we want for our moment predictor of pseudo moment consistency um, is not defined until our mean predictor is defined because pseudo moment consistency corresponds to mean consistency with respect to labels that aren't even defined until we have mu bar. And, and so that's what we have to resolve. And observe that satisfying either of these two conditions in isolation, if we fix one predictor or the other is easy. Because once we predict, well, once we fix mu bar, the condition we need on our moment predictor is just some mean consistency condition that we can achieve with gradient descent. Similarly, once we fix our moment predictor, the condition we need to satisfy for our mean predictor is a, just a, a mean consistency condition again. And so a natural idea is to try alternating gradient descent to repeatedly fix one and optimize for the other condition and hope that this works. And it does. So don't try to parse the pseudocode. I'll, I'll sort of walk you through it. We're going to initialize some mean predictor arbitrarily. And we're going to initialize a bunch of moment predictors, say all of the moment predictors from 2 through k, although you could do this for just one if you wanted. And we're going to repeat the following. We're going to say, OK, hmm, um, does our mean predictor, with respect to our current moment predictors, satisfy all of the mean consistency conditions that it ought to? Okay, And if the answer is no, we will, you know, that means we've found some set on which we are not mean consistent, that we are not alpha mean consistent, and we will use that to do a gradient descent update on the mean predictor. And after we've done that, we will take our current mean predictor and we will, for each moment that we care to predict, find a moment predictor that is pseudo moment consistent with respect to the pseudo moment labels defined by our current mean predictor. And we will repeat. Okay. Notably, like we're not ever like restarting gradient descent for our mean predictor. This is all one continuous, like gradient descent operation on our mean predictor. And so it's going to halt, right? Like each of these inner loops for finding pseudo moment consistency will halt after one over alpha squared many iterations. And similarly, this outer loop can't go on for more than one over alpha squared many iterations because at every iteration, we find some set on which we are not alpha mean consistent. It is not a set in the that, that necessarily corresponds to uh, a violation of mean conditioned moment multi-calibration in the end. It's just some set, but that's fine. And so the theorem is that alternating gradient descent performs at most k cubed over epsilon to the fourth many updates. And it outputs this ensemble of predictors of a, a mean predictor and a predictor for each of the first k moments, such that the mean predictor is mean multi-calibrated with respect to G. Okay. And each pair of mean predictor, in, well, the one mean predictor when paired with each of the moment predictors, simultaneously all of those pairs are epsilon mean conditioned moment multi-calibrated with respect to G. Um, I presented this as if it was, you know, as if our algorithm had direct access to the distribution, but in fact, it can be implemented straightforwardly with a finite sample. The sample needs to be of size equal to um, the number of iterations run by the algorithm times log the number of groups for which we want to be moment multi-calibrated divided by epsilon squared. Um, so we have sort of a polynomial dependence on our error parameters, but only a logarithmic dependence on the number of groups with which we want to be multi-calibrated. And, and so we can really think about that as being very large. Of course, the 
the number of groups will show up in our runtime, right? The, the algorithm is pretty simple, right? Like, like we run a relatively small number of iterations of gradient descent, but we have to, in new, you know, at every round, we have to find some group in this potentially large set on which we should be um, mean consistent, but but on which we are not. So you can always do that in t in whatever time it takes to enumerate all of the sets that you care about, which would have dependence linear in the size of G. But you can also express this problem of finding a set on which you are not mean consistent as, a, as an ERM problem, as a machine learning problem. And so um, if you have some algorithm or heuristic that lets you solve learning problems over G, you can replace this enumeration of G with, uh, with running this learning algorithm over G. All right, so, so I've, you know, I want to leave some time for questions. So, so let me not tell you much about the online problem, except to tell you that we can um, solve these things in the online setting as well. Um, in particular, like maybe you've heard about conformal prediction. Um, and here's what we can do, which is a, a setting that is sort of more general than is usually studied in conformal prediction, because in conformal prediction, there's usually an assumption that the data points you see are drawn either IID from some distribution or, or at least that they satisfy an exchangeability property, whereas we won't need that. We can work in a fully adversarial setting. OK, and so here's the setting. In rounds, an ad adversary will arbitrarily select some, um, some data point corresponding to a feature, on a feature vector on a label. We can have trained some arbitrary algorithm G on the history we've seen so far and use it to predict a label Y hat, OK? And that'll define some residual, the difference between the true label and our prediction. Now, our like online algorithm will propose a 95% prediction interval right, that's supposed to have the semantics that the residual falls within this prediction interval 95% of the time. And only then does the prediction algorithm learn the true label. And what we can achieve is that, um, you know, for an arbitrary adversary and an arbitrary learning algorithm, G, uh, we can make sure that these prediction intervals have about 95% coverage, not too large and not too small. OK, so let me skip over the details of, of how we do that, although it's kind of cool. Uh, and thank you. Let me end there, uh, take some questions. The, the results on moment multi-calibration um, in, the, in the batch setting, these are available on archive already uh, in a paper called Moment Multi-Calibration for Uncertainty Estimation. And the work on in the online setting, which I didn't have much time to tell you about, um, should be online you know, in the next month or two. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, did you work out any uh, sample complexity lower bounds, either in terms of epsilon or k? Um, yeah, let's see. So, so we don't have lower bounds, but let me see, tell you what the upper bounds are, because I, you know, I think they're the natural ones. So I sort of suspect the ones we get uh, from the online setting are tight. I guess I stopped sharing my screen. Let me try to do that again. Um, yes, so in sort of like the conformal prediction setting, the, you know, what we can get is that you know, we're aiming for coverage one minus delta, like 95%. Um, and the coverage that we get is sort of on the order of one over uh, one minus delta plus or minus an error term that's like one over root t um, times log the number of groups. That's sort of the dependence you'd expect. Um, so it's hard to imagine you could improve on that. Um, you know. In the moment multi-calibration setting, I suspect there are small improvements you can get. So we're sort of getting dependent. Let's see. 
Um, it scales with like one over epsilon to the sixth. That's probably not right. Um, anyway, the short answer to your question is is no. Uh, we don't have lower bounds. And can you suspect that the the looseness is in the upper bound? Say that again. You suspect that the upper bound is. Uh, in, so, so for if you just want prediction intervals in the online setting, uh, if you if you want prediction intervals, I think that we have basically the right bound. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do not think this is like the tight bound for moments. In that, I think that uh, you could probably get this epsilon to the sixth, you know, down to like epsilon squared. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and even the k terms. Um, yeah, maybe you can save on the k term. Although, let me note that the algorithm I described is coming up with. K predictors. So if you only wanted to predict like mean and the tenth moment, you wouldn't have to pay for one of these Ks here. Like this is assuming you're predicting the mean and all of the moments from one through ten. But but yeah, but like there's no claim that any of the dependencies are exactly tight. I had a question. Um, it's a really interesting talk. Um, can we think of multi-calibration in terms of um, quantiles on the distribution of y rather than moments? Is it is it useful because um, you know for sort of conveying probability distribution that feels uh, mm -hmm. that feels like an, uh, another useful perspective on calibration? That's right. So that's in fact that's sort of what we do in the online settings when we get these sort of conformal prediction in this sort of conformal prediction setting where we can get these like exactly tight prediction intervals we are not attempting to estimate moments and such we are um essentially estimating quantiles of the distribution um but it's not enough to get calibrated it's not enough to get predictors of the quantiles that are like individually calibrated. Basically, you need like some kind of joint consistency between like the left hand side of your interval and the right hand side of your interval. But but yes, yeah, um, okay. So okay. if you just want prediction intervals, the right thing to do is to try to get the right kind of calibration for quantiles of the CDF. Um, but if you want moments, uh, there, there's sort of different problems. Like from that, you cannot get moments, and and vice versa. Okay. Probably you're going out of time. Just, just one question, Aaron. How does this play around with privacy? Just to be true to the theme of the talk. Um, yeah, right. So, so you could probably like do it privately if you wanted. Uh, no, so actually, I mean, there is one connection to privacy, although, um, you know, I think I can remove it. Uh, but um, the way the sample complexity bounds work for this kind of algorithm, right? Like. You're basically having to estimate at every round of gradient descent uh, the mean over some set that was, but these sets are not defined up front. Like the means you have to estimate at like the tenth round of gradient descent depends on everything that happened thus far, and so you can't easily just take like a straightforward like union bound over all of them. But you can use like if you wanted to get slightly tighter bounds, you could use adaptive data analysis kinds of techniques. For differential privacy. I now, I think the sample complexity bounds we get from the online setting, right? Because if you have an online algorithm, you can get a, an offline algorithm from an online to online reduction, yeah. pr prove an even better sample complexity bound than you could get uh, from this adaptive data analysis kind of thing. So, so I think one of our contributions will be removing privacy from this literature. But. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I guess we are uh, out of time. Thank you, uh, Aaron, for like uh, speaking to us. It would be yeah. great if you could share your slides at some point of time. Sure. Yeah. Uh, happy to. Uh, and yeah, thanks for thanks for listening, everyone.